most important thing about this next study is this. The gospel is bad news before it can be good news. In other words, you've got to talk about sin and the wrath of God if you're going to understand the gospel. I remember when I bought an engagement ring for my wife, we went into a jeweler's shop and asked to see some rings. And first of all, he carefully covered the counter with black velvet cloth. And then he brought out the rings to show us. And you could only see the beauty of the ring against the black cloth. And you can only understand the gospel as good news if you realize the bad news. And the bad news is quite simply, what do people need to be saved from? It's no use talking about salvation if we don't tell people what they can be saved from. When I'm counseling a new inquirer, I always get round to one particular question. I ask them, you want to be a Christian? Yes. Do you want to accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Yes. What sins do you want him to save you from? And that question is the key question. Repentance only begins at that point. They always say, all of them, and I say, you haven't committed all of them. <laughs> what sins do you want him to save you from? And it's only when they begin to name them and be specific about sins. Christ did not come to save us from hell. That's a bonus thrown in. His name means he came to save his people from their sins, all of them. Until you're saved from all of them, you're not saved yet. I better tell you straight away, I'm not saved yet. But I'm on the way of salvation. I'm on the way. And I'm looking forward to being saved, aren't you? You're not so clear about that, are you? In Romans, Paul is going to say in chapter 13... We are nearer our salvation than when we first believed. And I've never heard that preached on. Our salvation is future as well as past. We're looking forward to being saved. We're looking forward to the day when there's no trace of sin left in me. Looking forward to the day when I'm perfectly restored to the image of God. That's when I shall be saved. And then, and only then, will I shout, once saved, always saved. Because then it will be true. Now, all this is due to the fact that the word sin has dropped out of use. Again, it's not politically correct. But we've got to face the darkness of sin and what it's like. And what it means quite specifically only then will we understand the gospel. Only then will, will we appreciate it. Until you understand the wrath of God, you will not appreciate the love of God. It's as simple as that. And so Paul has said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And this is where it begins. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. That's the first part of Revelation. The wrath, the anger of God. People have tried to explain it away as his holy indignation, but it's more than that. God hates sin. It has ruined his creation for us as well as for him. God hates it. And until we realize that God hates sin, we'll not really appreciate that God loves sinners. So important, this. So we start with wrath before love. The God of the Bible has two sides to his character. On the one hand, he loves people. On the other hand, he hates people. 
On the one hand, he punishes people. On the other hand, he pardons people. On the one hand, he shows his justice. On the other hand, his mercy. And if we, get, if we forget either of those two sides, we will preach a distorted gospel. And so the first thing we have to talk about in this talk is the wrath of God being revealed. First against Gentiles, then against Jews, and then against everybody. For, as it will be summed up, we have all sinned. Now Jesus said this, when the Holy Spirit has come to you, he will convict the world of three things. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And a person needs to understand all those three words if they're going to make any headway in the Christian life. The fact of sin, the fact of righteousness, and the fact of judgment when the two meet. And so the righteousness of God is a threat The righteousness from God is an offer. And it's keeping those two things together that we're concerned about in this talk. Now, beginning with the Gentiles, tactfully, Paul talks about them in the third person, they. Talking about the Gentile world, the Roman world, in which these people were brought up. But he's tactful, assuming they've all left it behind. Well, now, what is it in this godless world? Well, the first fact is that people give God up. And once they've done that, God responds quite positively by giving them up. And that's only fair, that's only just. If we give him up, he gives us up. And we look at both sides of this. First of all, people give God up. And of course, whenever the Bible talks about God, it's not talking about any God. It's not talking about other religions. It's talking about the God of Israel, who is the only one who really exists. No other God exists. They're all figments of the imagination. That's part of the Christian truth, but it's very offensive in a world that is wanting to bring all religions together. And Tony Blair, our former prime minister, is now building up a huge uh, foundation of his own to bring all religions together from around the world. And of course, this was behind the um, Shimon Peres of Israel going to the Pope and suggesting the same thing. It's becoming the most popular idea in the world, the idea that we bring all religions into one. The Bible does predict that there will be one world religion one day, but it's not going to be a a religion of God, be a religion of the Antichrist, not of Christ. But that is the talk today. Now, Paul accuses godless people of doing two things of suppressing the truth about God and of substituting lies. That one is a positive, the other is a negative accusation. They are suppressing the truth. Now that's quite an insight into human nature. As Paul goes on to say, there is no excuse for atheism. There is no excuse for not believing in God because everybody has access to the truth about God in two ways. One, creation around us and two, conscience within us. Creation around us should tell us that God is powerful and divine, that the person who put all this in space and brought it all into being, must be a powerful God, his power and his divinity. His, his, I've called it his godness. 
And we mustn't think of God as a big human being. God is God. There is only one God and there's no one else like him. His godness is clearly seen in what he has made. You just need to go and study the trees around us and you should know that God is an amazing God. God is a creative God. There are no two blades of grass the same, no two snowflakes the same, no two clouds the same. What an amazing creative artist he is. There are no two people the same. Even identical twins have their differences. What a God. And it's visible in everything his hand has made. So we are without excuse. Now when the Bible talks about atheism, it doesn't mean someone who doesn't believe in God, but someone who ignores God. Someone for whom God isn't part of their life. Someone who can go right through life without thinking about God at all. And that is a deliberate suppression of truth. They could have known and they've suppressed that knowledge. How often I've found that when trying to reach an unconverted person, you find they are deliberately suppressing. If you answer one question satisfactorily, they'll come up with another one. Answer that, they'll come up with another one. And you finally come to the conclusion, they don't want to know the truth. They're suppressing it, why? because they'd have to change. Take the resurrection. The evidence for the rex resurrection would convince any jury on earth that Jesus rose from the dead. And that is why so many top lawyers have become Christians. There are more Christians in the legal profession than any other. If they are prepared to examine the evidence they are convinced themselves that Jesus rose from the dead. I could give you a list of the most prominent lawyers in Britain who, after the examining the evidence for the resurrection, have had to change their minds, but they've had to change their lives too. And that's why most people won't face the evidence, because if Jesus did rise from the dead, then everything he said is also true. And that means my life has to change from a self-centered life to a God-centered life. And not many people want that. So let's suppress the truth. Let's suppress the evidence. There are bags of evidence outside the Bible for the existence of Jesus and for his miracles, historical records that are not in our Bible which say he was a wonder worker. People don't want to know about that evidence, even if you produce it. There's that within godlessness which says, I don't want to know. I've never believed in God and I don't intend to now. That is suppression of truth. And every living being has access to the creation outside us and the conscience within us and should know that there is a God and that right and wrong matter to him and that we are made in his image and therefore have that sense of right and wrong. Even the most primitive savage on earth has a conscience and will tell you what is right and wrong. Mind you, we usually see what's wrong in other people more easily than we see it in ourselves, but we know a difference when we say that's wrong. He or she shouldn't be doing that. That's God giving us the same sense of right and wrong as he has. Not only do godless people suppress the truth, they have to substitute lies for the truth. That's because there's a God-shaped blank in every human being that has to be filled with something or someone to worship. I don't need to tell you the young people today who worship pop stars. And you can see them with arms upraised and clapping and doing everything else. 
and worshiping someone of their own kind. They have substituted a creature for the creator. Or if you watch grown men at a football match, football is the religion of England for men. And they get very religious at a football match and fling themselves around and shout and cheer. You can't imagine any of them going to church and doing the same thing. <laughs> but they're worshiping. They're worshiping a bunch of men and a lump of leather on, on the pitch. And they will talk about that team as if they're talking about their God with whom they identify and whom they worship on Saturday afternoons. You see, we can't be godless people without substituting something or someone into that God-shaped blank in our human soul. There is therefore, as Paul says, no excuse whatever. People are exchanging darkness for light. They're exchanging mortals for immortal. And it's a substitute religion. And of course, religion itself can become a substitute for God. Being religious is probably the majority of the human race wants to be religious in one way or another. And therefore they imagine their God. But in Britain itself, I notice how many people tell me, well, this is what I think God is like. And it's not what the Bible reveals, what he's said about himself, it's what they think God is like. And uh, they've built an image of God in their minds and it's pure imagination but it's the God they want to think of, the God they like to think of, the God they even pray to. A student came up to a friend of mine and said, I've been looking for God so long and I can't find him. And my friend said to him, well, how strange. He's been looking for you for longer than that. <laughs> However, have you missed each other? That was a pretty good answer because the God that the student was looking for was the God of his own imagination. The God he wanted to find, the God he believed in, was not the God who showed himself to be the God of Israel. That's a great offense to the world that the only God there exists is the God of Israel. The philosophers call that the scandal of particularity. Let me tell you what that means. It's a scandal that God should speak to only one nation on earth. Why didn't God speak to the Americans or the Russians or the Australians or the British? Why did God have to reveal himself to the Jews and tell them to tell everybody else. It's a scandal. And philosophers can't accept that scandal of particularity. But it's the way God has chosen to reveal himself. We had three children. One is now in heaven, but the other two are still with us on earth. And when we had three little children, I brought them sweets or candies every Saturday. And I had a choice. I could either give one of them a bag of sweets and say, share that with your brother and sister. Or I could say, I've got three bars of chocolate, one for you and one for you and one for you. Now, if I gave them in the second way, we had peace. But if I gave them in the first way, <laughs> we didn't. You've got more than I have. And there was argument and dissension because I gave to one child to share with the others. But that's God's method. He said, I'm going to give you, Abraham, everything I can and your descendants and you will bless all the families of the earth. Now that's a scandal. 
It means the world, if it's going to find God, has to go to the Jews to find him. And particularly to the Jew Jesus to find him. And that's offensive. It's a scandal. Why should I have to go to the Jews? One British poet wrote a very simple short poem which goes like this. How odd of God to choose the Jews. And another poet added an extra verse which went like this. But odder still that those who choose the Jewish God and scorn the Jews, <laughs> which those two English poets had summed it all up. We are all indebted to the Jews. The Bible I'm teaching is a Jewish book through and through. The Jesus who saved you is a Jew. The apostles were all Jewish. The church was solid Jewish at the beginning. And we'll catch up in the end too. I once said to a Jew in a shop that I was visiting, my best friend is a Jew. And he looked quite pleased about that. <laughs> I said, in fact, he saved my life. <laughs> and he looked, re he looked really doubly pleased. He was almost puffing out with pride. <laughs> and he said, who was that? <laughs> That's when it all collapsed. <laughs> 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 but it's true. I'm going to jump ahead and say we are to make Jews jealous, not envious. And most people don't know the difference. And the NIV got it wrong. And in chapter 11 it says we are to make the Jews envious. No, no, make them jealous. How do you do that? By talking about what they have that we've found. Not by talking about what we found, but by what we found of theirs. We have found their Messiah. We are reading their Bible. We have found their Jesus. We worship their God. And we do that gladly because we believe they had the truth and that their God was the only one who exists. So we'll see more of that in chapter 11. I'm jumping ahead. So here is this terrible accusation of the Gentiles that they have suppressed the truth and substituted lies and have become foolish though they think they're wise. They're self-deluded. That's a very dangerous form of deception. Idolatry is giving God up and producing something or someone else to take his place. Usually the wrong thing or the wrong person. Now what does that lead to? God giving them up. And we now see the signs of God's wrath in society. They're listed here. It reads like a police station desk blotter. It reads like a Sunday cheap newspaper. It's an amazing description of what happens when you give God up. And the answer is he doesn't just remain aloof, and indifferent, he acts. He shows his anger. Now there are two words for the anger of God in the Greek language, and it's interesting, both are used in the New Testament. One is for simmering anger, and the other is for anger that boils over. If I can use a simple illustration, if you put a pan of milk on the stove, to warm for a drink. You're very foolish if you don't watch it carefully because it will begin to simmer and little bubbles will come to the surface. And if you ignore that, it will come to the point where it 
suddenly boils over, makes a mess, gets burnt, and you have a mess on your hand to clear up. Now, God's anger is a bit like that. At the moment, God's anger is simmering. And unless you watch carefully, you will miss the bubbles coming up. But one day, it's going to boil over. And that is called the Day of Wrath, here in chapter 2. So God's wrath is revealed in two phases. Phase one, where it's simmering. And it's not too obvious, except to those who are watching and who recognize what's happening. But one day, in the day of wrath, God's anger will boil over. And that's a day when he will really deal with all those who've spoiled his world. But it talks here about God's amazing patience and tolerance in waiting before it boils over. So first we look at God's anger just bubbling up to the surface. And I see it very clearly in England and indeed throughout the Western world and other countries influenced by the West. God's anger is really simmering. And the little bubbles that come up are described here. And they're described first in terms of bodies and then in terms of minds. When God gives human beings up, something happens to their bodies and to their minds. And all of that is God's bubbling wrath just under the surface. It's getting warmer, it's getting hotter. Let's take first of all the, the, I should have changed around those two adjectives. Let's talk about debased bodies and depraved minds because that's what the Bible talks about. I'm sorry I got those two wrong way round. But it means the same thing. When God gives men up, he is giving them up to themselves to all that's bad in themselves. Now, most of us in this room, if not all of us, have homosexuality in our bodies. It may come out in a harmless way when we're in our teens and we get a crush for a teacher or an adult person of the same sex, but we are all capable of homosexuality because that is in us all. And when God gives you up, he takes the brakes off and he leaves you up to what he calls your shameful desires. And when God doesn't hold on to you, what you really want to do comes out and it's not very nice. And so one thing that is clearly described here is that you become antisexual. That's what happens to your body. And what happens to your mind is that it becomes antisocial. And when you read through the list in Romans 1, you're literally reading a cheap newspaper. You're reading what's happening all around. God made male and female. And he made us that way for each other. And for marriage between one man and one woman, that's God's plan for sex. And sex within marriage and commitment and not sex outside that. That was God's plan. But as soon as he gives men up, they become antisocial. And one of the first things that happens is that men begin to have sex with men and women with women which God never intended, never planned. It's within us all. So don't condemn people and say, you're a homosexuality. Say to yourself, I could be that if God didn't keep his hand on me. I think that's nearer the truth. And then you begin to understand what's happening around you. We've now passed laws in England for same-sex marriage. And it is now officially possible for a man to marry a man 
and a woman to marry money. That's, that's anti-sexual rebellion against God. It's distorting his order for family and for happiness. But we've fallen for it, and it's going to spread around the whole world, believe it or not. I don't think it's here in Singapore yet, but it will come, mark my words. Because godless people don't like God's way of living. And that's within all of us. We have a fallen nature with wrong desires. It's not just in the realm of sex, it's in the realm of food. You can eat to live or live to eat. That's another of our shameful desires. God created food for us to enjoy, to live. But we can t turn it into a little God. And our television programs in Britain are now packed with gourmet programs as to how to make more exciting food and tickle your fancy. And people are swallowing it all as if they're living for food rather than eating to live. It can happen with money. Money is a very good servant, but it's a horrible master. And you can use it for good purposes, but if you once devote yourself to money as a god, you're worshipping mammon, and you become addicted. And businessmen who've made all that they could possibly need for the rest of their lives will go on grabbing new businesses, grabbing more money, because they will never be satisfied. Addictions can't be satisfied. They act like drugs, and you need more and more and more to satisfy. I think you can see in all this, we're talking about the real world in which we live. We're talking about what's happening around us, and that is the wrath of God being revealed which is turning good desires into addictions. And it's not just young people. I see it in every age group. You can see God giving men up because they've given him up and think they can get away with it. I was speaking in a factory canteen once and a man got up and he said, what do you think of this? He said, I'm not boasting but I live a good life. And he said, all the other workers around me will tell you how helpful I am to them. My neighbors at home in the street will tell you that if they're ever in trouble, I'm the one they turn to, I'm the one that helps them. But he said, I don't pray, I don't go to church, I don't read the Bible. He said, how do you explain that? I just looked him in the face and I said, you don't go to church, you don't pray, you don't read the Bible, but I'll bet your grandfather did. And he collapsed. <laughs> he didn't realize that you can be living on your parents' and grandparents' faith up to about the third or fourth generation. But if you stop the root of Christianity, you, you will lose the fruit by the third or fourth generation. And you're seeing it happen all around us. People said in my day, why be married in church? Now they say, why be married at all? And it happens over two or three generations very clearly. You lose your spiritual capital. And the result is your, your grain grandchildren or great-grandchildren have not inherited the root and cannot maintain the fruit. And again, that's happening on a wide scale. But again, you can see God's wrath in it all. And in a sense, God's mercy. He's showing us where this all leads. He's saying you're on a wrong course. And you can now see it because I'm helping you to see it. I'm giving men up to themselves. Well, it's not just food, fame, control, money, possessions. You can see that happening all around you. 
but it's what's happening to minds too. Not just anti-sexual bodies or bodies given over to shameful desires. And I don't think sex is a shameful desire. If it's used God's way, it's a pleasure. But if it's not used God's way, it becomes an, an addiction and a shameful desire. Now let's look at what happens to the mind. And when you read the list in Romans 1, you're reading of minds that are antisocial, rebellious to parents, gossips. There's a whole long list of things that the mind has been filled with and that explain antisocial behavior because behavior springs from our minds, how we think, what we are. And that again is God at work and showing us clearly where this is going to lead. Now I'm pleased that some Christians in their own field are pointing out where this will lead and can see and now prove statistically the results in the next generation. And that's good and it's a good thing for us to do. It's part of exposing evil but the world will not easily see it. They follow their addictions and it's not easy to stop that. So de debased bodies and depraved minds and one of the climaxes of a depraved mind is that not only are they constantly thinking up new ways to do bad things themselves, they positively encourage others to do the same. Because if you're behaving in a wrong fashion, the comfort can come by saying, well, others are doing it too. And you become an evangelist for evil. And that's the last verse in chapter one. Not only do they do these things themselves, but they encourage and approve them in other people. And it spreads like an infection. Addiction and infection go together. They spread alarmingly quickly. As bad as Ebola in a spiritual sense. We are, after all, inherently self-centered people. And all God has to do to show his wrath to us is to let, it, let us go. And if you've got a car parked on a hill and you take the brake off, what's going to happen? It'll just go downhill. And if you wonder why society is heading the way it is, the simple explanation is God has taken the brake off. That's how his wrath shows at the moment. It's not boiling over. When it does, the world will really wake up and realize. But it's simmering. And those who watch and pray can see it and can see it happening and can warn people of what the results are. So that's Gentiles and how they sin. And it's open, it's blatant, unembarrassed, unashamed, and that's the Gentiles. But when you turn to the Jews, their sin is of a rather different kind. It's still sin. But first, it's hidden. And we now move to the Jewish sin, and we change the verb from, or the pronoun from they, to you, and even we, because Paul counts himself as a Jew. And the first thing he says is, you're hypocrites. You condemn it in others and you do it yourself. And it's interesting that psychologists would tell us we're good at accusing others of the very things that are our weakness. Because we spotted it takes one to know one. You point a finger at somebody else, you've got three fingers pointing back at yourself. That's the moral of this passage. 
condemnation of others comes happily to those who are hiding their own sins. And that was the Pharisees to a T in Jesus' day. That's why he called them whited sepulchres, whitewashed sepulchres, whitewashed tombs. If the Gentiles display their sins and approve others, Jews tend to disapprove sin in others and hide it in themselves. I remember a Jew in Jerusalem saying to me, we Jews are only human, only more so. I thought that really summed it up. He said, if people are greedy, we Jews can be as greedy as anyone else. If people are this, we can do it better. He was really telling me they can do virtue and vice better than anyone else. And they can. Jews have many good virtues. Family life is second to none. But their vices are equally more than human. And it's part of God's calling to them that they are to be a demonstration to the world. And if they don't choose to be the demonstration of his mercy, they will be a demonstration of his justice. That's the meaning of the potter and the clay. I hope you understand why the Bible suggests we are clay in the potter's hands. It's not suggesting that God is responsible for everything in us. And Jeremiah was taken, you can read it in chapter 18 of his book, he was taken to the potter's house to watch the potter with a wheel. And he's pedaling away with his feet. The wheel is spilling round and he throws a lump of clay on the wheel. And Jeremiah watched him try and make it into a beautiful vase, a lovely shape. But the clay would not run in his hands. So he took the clay and put it back into a lump, threw it on the wheel and made a crude pot that would be used maybe in the kitchen for something. He wanted to make it a beautiful vessel, but he couldn't because the clay would not run in his hands. So he made it into a crude, ugly pot, same clay. And Jeremiah was asked by the Lord, who decided whether that clay became a beautiful vase or ugly pot. And Jeremiah had to say, the clay, not the potter, the clay. And then the Lord said to Jeremiah, I wanted to make Israel a beautiful nation for the world to see my righteousness. But they wouldn't respond to my hand. And so I'm going to make them an ugly pot of my justice. And it underlines it was Israel's choice. And every one of us in this room is the vessel of God we've chosen to be. And everybody outside this room is. We either respond to God's touch and let his hands mold us into a beautiful man or woman or else he will make us an ugly example of his justice. And the choice will be ours, not his. He is the potter. And he will make us one thing or the other, but the choice which will be ours. Do you understand now the picture of the potter and the clay? It's not a helpless picture. We have a chorus, you are the potter, I am the clay, as much as say, I'm just clay in your hands. No, I can choose to let the Lord make me beautiful or make me ugly. But it will be my choice, not his. That's an amazing insight which will help us when we come to Romans 9, which brings up again the potter and the clay picture. Very important. Now then, those who condemn others are passing judgment on others. 
and must face divine judgment because they do the same thing. To condemn others is in danger of being contempt for God. That's the next verse. God's kindness, tolerance, and patience puts up with an amazing lot from people. How incredibly patient. Why doesn't God destroy them straight away? I always smile when somebody says to me, why doesn't God destroy all the bad people in the world now? And then the rest of us could live in peace and harmony. <laughs> Have you had someone say that to you? There's a fatal flaw in the argument. <laughs> And the fatal flaw is that they're always sure that they would still be around. Listen, if God destroyed all those who are spoiling the world, you wouldn't have a teacher this morning. And there'd be nobody, sit, nobody sitting out there either. If God had dealt with me in justice, I wouldn't be here. Praise God. For his kindness, his tolerance, his patience. But if I take advantage of that, I'm storing up wrath for the day of wrath. Nobody gets away with it. God keeps a record. It's comforting that when I read of young men bursting into old age pensioners, cottages in England and raping them and getting away with it, 75% of crime in Britain is not discovered. It pays to be a criminal now. You stand a better chance now of getting away with it. But nobody gets away with it with God. You are storing up wrath for the day of wrath when it boils over. And that's going to be an awful day. That's part of the message of the book of Revelation where people, even suffering to the nth degree, are refusing to repent. Stubborn. I'm not going to change whatever God does. And he's going to give an increasing exposure of his wrath to people as we near the end of history. That's the message of Revelation. Not to the those who trust him, but to the world, there are very rough days coming and they will demonstrate God's wrath and make it clearer and clearer that God is angry at spoiling his world and still stubborn human beings will not repent, change their mind. So the divine restraint is taken off but nevertheless, he is still tolerant of so much. Human repentance is a difficult thing for anyone to do. Now, the next thing about the Jews and their sin is their shame compared with people who've never known better. It's an extraordinary comparison. They have had the law. And they know perfectly well that though we are justified by faith, we are judged by works. Everybody. And that's an important double statement. We may be justified by faith, but we will all be judged by works or by the little word do. And here's the key word in this next section. It's the word we shall be judged by what we do. And that applies as much to Christians as to anybody else. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, we, we believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive according to the things done in the body. That means done in this life. Judgment is always on deeds, what we've done. And therefore, Paul dares to say, a person who's done, persistently done good, will be accepted by God. And a person who's persistently done evil will be condemned. And the key is the word do. 
Now, by comparison, he says to rebuke the Jew, there are Gentiles who do the right thing, and they have no law. They've never heard the Ten Commandments, but they've done the right thing. How come? He says they have the law of God written in their hearts. There's the conscience again. And this is the answer to how will God judge those who've never heard the gospel? A frequent question when you invite questions. And the answer is God will judge everybody according to the light they have received. No more, no less. In other words, everyone will be judged by what they consider to be wrong in others. That's a thought. <laughs> Whatever you consider wrong in others, God will hold against you if you're doing the same thing. Another dig at the secrecy angle. Do you know that the, the sin was in the world long before the Moses law came in? long before the Ten Commandments in, I've made a list of the things that humanity recognizes wrong before Moses gave the laws. And here's the list. Coveting, idolatry, murder, profligacy, adultery, pride, selfishness, dishonoring parents, injustice, Incest, almost every society on earth has said incest is wrong. And they haven't got that from the Bible. They've got it from the law of God written in their hearts. And deceit. Every one of those things is condemned as wrong in the book of Genesis before any law was given. Everybody knows. And so to shame the Jews, Paul is saying... There are Gentiles who know enough to do some good things. And you've had so much more knowledge, you Jews. You should be that much better people. In fact, the world expects that of Israel. Have you noticed? The world will condemn Israel for things they don't condemn in anybody else. Why? Because they expect the Jewish people who've given the highest moral standards to the world to live up to them. And they judge Israel by a higher standard than any other nation. Because they've had more revelation. Because they've given the Ten Commandments to the world. These are maybe new thoughts to some of you, but God is absolutely fair. He will never judge a person by a light they didn't receive. And so to every human being, God will say, whatever you see wrong, especially in other people, I will judge you by. Absolutely fair. Nothing could be more just. We're still in the bad news, by the way. <laughs> the next thing he mentions is the superiority of Jews. The fact that they have the commandments whether they keep them or not. The fact that they gave the world the commandments gives Jews a sense of superiority. And he says, listen, you may have instructed others, but you didn't bother to instruct yourself. You ignored yourself. You gave the world the commandments, and you don't keep them. It's the old one finger pointing to others and three to self. The other thing in verses 25 to 29, which Jews are complacent and even boastful about, is we have circumcision. There are just a few things that have enabled the Jews to keep their identity after being scattered among the nations for so many years. One is the Sabbath, another is the diet, and one is circumcision. And Paul now says, circumcision that is only outward and physical will be quite irrelevant on the Day of Judgment. 
it matters nothing to God unless it's matched by a circumcision in the heart. When the desires of the flesh are removed from the heart, that circumcision really matters to God. So the Jews have this sense of superiority over the commandments and over circumcision, but it's no use to them unless they keep them. Then the next thing he condemns in Jewish sin is self-justification. And this is very common among Jewish people. I've talked and talked to them. Self-justification. It was a Jew who came up to Jesus and it said, and he was willing to justify himself. The one thing you can't ever do is justify yourself. You know what justify means, I'm sure. If a man comes home very late, early as that, early hours of the morning, half drunk, the wife will say, justify yourself. <laughs> Explain it to me. Prove to me that you were in the right. That's what they mean. And self-justification is very common. Now, how do the Jews do that? Well, first, on the grounds that they brought the revelation of God to the world. And they can justify their sin by pointing that out. And the revelation, they were entrusted with God's word. And only they gave the world God's word. And they can feel complacent about that. That justifies however they behave. But Paul says, look, even if all of you were not believing were faithless to God. God's word is still faithful. Let every man be a liar and God is still true. The revelation he gave you does not justify the way you're living. It justifies God, but not you. And the second extraordinary argument that they were using in Paul's day and still sometimes do is that if my sin brings out God's grace, and if my bad living brings out God's goodness, then why should he blame us? It's the old argument. Surely it helps the world to understand God's grace if we sin. An argument we'll see coming up again in chapter 6. It's amazing that human beings can convince themselves, can contend that because God's grace was manifest to our sin, that justifies our sin. Listen, we're going to have to learn that God can never justify sin. He can justify sinners, but he can't ever justify what they do. So let's get that absolutely clear. God will never approve or justify sin. He can't. He's righteous. Let's move on. Time is going. The Jews, of course, have the scriptures. So here Paul turns to their own scriptures. They're proud of the fact that they brought the Old Testament to the world they, they revel in the fact that God chose them to reveal himself to everybody else. But the very scriptures which they have are full of observations that tell us how bad they are. And we now have quotations from four Psalms. Psalm 14, Psalm 53, Psalm 5, Psalm 140, Three quotes from them, Psalm 36. And in every case, we have David observing human nature in the raw. And this is what he says of them. No one is righteous. Now that's King David, who is a man after God's own heart. 
and a man in a position to think well of people, and yet his observation of nature is that he hasn't met anyone in his life who was righteous. Now that's because he's measuring them by the righteousness of God. It's why Jesus objected to being called good master. He said, why do you call me good? No one is good but only God. There is only one person in the universe who's good, who is righteous, and that's God. He will always be in the right. When he justifies a person, that person is now in the right. I'm jumping ahead. We're going to look at justification this afternoon. But I love the Pigeon English Bible of New Guinea. They don't use the word justified or justification. They have God, Ise, Im all right. I love that. <laughs> That's justification. God, Ise, Im all right. All right. That's what the word righteous means, to be in the right. In everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, everything you feel, to be in the right. And there's only one person in the universe who's always in the right. And that's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so in the Psalms, there are comments on no one is righteous. And he illustrates that in two ways. First, in their deeds and secondly, in their words. I was having my hair cut years and years ago by a man called Chris, whom I regularly patronized with my needs for haircut. And I can remember on one occasion, he was cutting my hair and had got to that point there behind my right ear. And he suddenly said, I'm as good as anyone who goes to your church. And uh, that ended the conversation. I didn't know what to say. My little book on witnessing didn't tell me how to answer that. <laughs> and so I was silent for a bit, and he cut right round the back to behind my left ear. And at that point, he spoke again, and he said, well, perhaps not quite. By the time we'd finished the haircut, he was singing a different tune. But I said, it doesn't matter if you were as good as anyone who goes to our church. That would make no difference. I said, you're measuring yourself up by other people. That's fatal. When we say he's a good man or she's a good woman, we are using a comparative term compared to anyone else. But Jesus summed up human nature. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking him? It's a lovely promise. If you then, being evil, another text, Jesus would not put his trust in any man, for he knew what was in man. Now, if you've been brought up on a nice view of Jesus, who trusted people and thought the best of them, you should study the scripture more carefully. Jesus would not trust anybody because he knew what was in people. That's quite a statement. And he said, if you then, being evil, know how to give goods to your children, good gifts, which of you, being asked for a bit of bread, would give them a stone or a scorpion? You can read it all in Luke 11. It's a very keen argument there. Now, here is the point of utter difference between the Christian thinking and humanist thinking. To the humanist, people are basically good. 
but know how to do bad things. To Jesus and Christians, human nature is basically bad, but knows how to do good things. And there's a world of difference between those two diagnoses of our human condition. And it's very important to ask yourself as a Christian, whose view of human nature do I accept? The humanist who says that people in their hearts are good, even, now what was the girl's name in? Anne Frank. Have you read that amazing story of Anne Frank in the Netherlands who was holed up in hiding by the Germans. I have a lovely letter at home which I found the other day from Anne Frank's father because my daughter played the part of Anne Frank in, in the play, The Diary of Anne Frank. And we got in touch with the father who is still alive. But at the end of that diary, she says, I believe that people are basically good. And I thought, I'm afraid that's not true, And But she died in that faith that after all the Germans did to her and her family, she believed that underneath, basically, human nature is good. The Bible says human nature is fallen. And that if you take the humanist line that anybody is basically good but only does bad things, and not the Christ-like view of human nature. We are being evil, but know how to do good things. That's the difference. The world wants the humanist view. Even some Christians want it. But if you're going to have a realistic understanding, and you know the more you get to be like Christ, the nearer you get to him, I think the more you realize how bad you are and what your life might have been if God hadn't stepped in, where you would have finished up. I don't know, but I know which direction it would have been. If God had not stepped into your life, would you have gone up or down? That's the big question. So the scripture's commentary on human nature is that there is no one righteous, no one good enough for God's standards. Measure yourself by Jesus or by God and you'll realize the truth about yourself. Measure yourself by the people next door or the Muslims in Iran and Iraq. Measure yourself by people in the world who behead innocent people. Measure yourself by them and you could come to the conclusion that, well, I'm a pretty good person. And it's amazing how many people think that being kind to grandmother and the cat is a Christian. We know how to do good things, but we are basically bad people. That's why the wrath of God shows us up by taking the brakes off. We all owe gratitude for God's restraint on us through our parents, through the state we belong to, through our neighborhood, which have all kept us back from doing worse things. But when the brakes come off, then you see yourself as you really are. And scripture not only talks about people's evil deeds, but they're evil words. And I think that finds me out and everybody else. Would you like everything you've said about everybody else played on a recorder to this room? Somebody said if everybody knew what each had said of the other, there wouldn't be four friends left in the world. <laughs> There were two women talking on a bus and one said to the other, I don't like her, and from all I've said about her, I never will. <laughs> Which, when you think it through, is a priceless remark. 
but we've all offended in word. And Jesus said, for every idle word, we shall be brought into judgment. And an idle word is a word that was carelessly uttered, a word that slipped out, a word that revealed your real thoughts about something or someone. And I could easily prove that I and just about everybody else in this room has said the wrong thing sometimes. This little tongue, said James in his letter, it may be a small member, but it's set on fire by hell. And more people have offended in tongue, not least in the things they've said in church, set to music. I'm afraid I've got to the stage where I will not sing a hymn if I don't mean it because there are more lies sung in church than anywhere. <laughs> when you really look into what we sing, what we're saying to God, set to music, and it's really humbling. There was a dear man came to our church. He was the head of the finance of uh, British Overseas Airways Corporation, which was uh, British Airways at that time. Top job in the finance. And he came to church with his wife, and four, three lovely boys, they really were. He was a scoutmaster in his spare time. People would have said he was a good man, but I noticed that he never sang a hymn. His family sang, but he never did. And I asked him about it, I said, Reg, why don't you sing a hymn? And he said, because I don't mean it. And he said, I think it would be dishonest. And as a scout leader, I promise to be honest and I'm not going to sing a hymn I don't mean. And I really admired that man for that because one day he started singing. <laughs> and I knew that he meant it. And he was a changed man. And he was the first man I ever baptized as a believer along with my wife at the same time. I remember baptizing the two of them, but that was Reg. As a scout leader, he was going to be honest, and I'm not going to sing anything I don't mean. <laughs> I commend that to you. It might spoil the singing in your church <laughs> if you stop singing, but it'd be more honest with God. But this little tongue is the most difficult thing to control in your body. There was a vicar in the Church of England back home and he said to the congregation, I'm going to show you that part of my body that I have most difficulty in controlling. <laughs> and there was a deathly hush <laughs> came over the whole congregation and he, <laughs> and he made his point by shocking them all into silence. <laughs> but you have. This really, this little thing in here, if you've sinned in no other way in your life, think about what you've said. The three classic questions to ask yourself before you speak. Is it kind? Is it true? Is it necessary? And much of what we say won't pass those simple questions. So it's not just our deeds, but our words. And he said, there's poison on our lips. And there is more damage has been done in words. Words are used by God. Most of the gifts of the Spirit are word gifts. But the devil also uses the tongue. And look at some of the most evil men who existed and Many of them had a gift of oratory and persuasion. You just watch any film of Adolf Hitler and speech was his biggest weapon and he used it with power and great effect. Poison. In fact, says Paul, our mouths are like an open grave rotten and stinking. 
And then he mentions our feet. That we sin with our feet. How do you do that? Will your feet take you where you want to go? Now the Bible often says, beautiful are the feet of him who brings good tidings. Did you ever realize your feet are beautiful? Because they took you to someone who needed to hear your testimony. But the devil can use your feet too to direct you into the wrong place. The conclusion, no one fears God. And in that simple statement, David has put his finger right on the root problem. It is true today that even in church, the fear of God has often disappeared. The early society of friends were nicknamed Quakers, because when they met for worship, they trembled before God. They quaked. And they became known as the Quakers. They've lost that nickname now. They're just called the Society of Friends now. But the early Society of Friends trembled before God. I have been in some worship sessions where I've seen people trembling before God. Now, this is an idea that is so alien to some modern church people. Fear God. But it's not just in the Old Testament, it's written in the New, right through. God says, don't fear those who can kill your body and do nothing worse. Fear him who can destroy body and soul in hell. And he's not meaning the devil there, he's meaning God. Who's afraid of God? You're only afraid of God if you have a real sense of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And if there's one thing missing today, it's the fear of God. We live in a day when his love has been so overemphasized that fear has disappeared. I've written a book about that. I've traveled around churches, I've heard so much about the love of God, and there's very, very little of fear of God. But he is a God to fear. As long as there's sin remaining in me, I should fear God, if I'm not letting him deal with it. Because there's a price to pay. So, uh, portion of scripture that begins, no one is righteous, ends with the conclusion, no one fears God. Many of our politicians would be better at their job if they feared God. It's a fundamental emotion that is a healthy emotion. If it becomes a phobia, it's unhealthy. We have many phobias, and that's an exaggerated fear that paralyzes. But when my children were at a certain age, they came and said, Daddy, can you get us some bicycles, please? And I said, not just yet. And they said, well, everybody else in school has a bicycle. And I tried to put them off a bit because we lived on a very dangerous road. And uh, I was passing on to them a phobia. What I should have done is passed on to them the real fear of traffic, a healthy fear which made them careful, a healthy fear which anticipated trouble on the road. A phobia paralyzes. Oh, you can't go out on a bicycle at all. That's a phobia. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a healthy fear of God that makes us careful and makes us aware of danger. There's a phobia of God which paralyzes. <laughs> 
and you can't move. And there are loads of phobias that people have, fear of open spaces, closed spaces, darkness, spiders, and so on. Those are irrational phobias. And you know, we're only born with two fears. The fear of falling and the fear of a loud noise. And you can frighten a newborn baby with those two things. Pretend to drop them or shout. But every other fear we have picked up, either as children or even adults, every other fear is picked up from others. Did you know that? The one fear that's so often missing is fear of God. If you fear cancer more than God, that's got your life out of order. People fear all kinds of things, but I very rarely meet anybody who's afraid of God. And yet when you consider his power, his majesty, and above all his righteousness, there's plenty of reason to fear God. I have to add there that there is one teaching that has taken away the fear of the Lord from many people. And it's summed up in four words, once saved, always saved. And I've noticed that that has removed fear of God from people and given them a false security and a false complacency. We'll have to face that later in chapter 11 of Paul's letter to the Romans, where he clearly states that believers can lose their salvation. Couldn't have stated it more clearly. But I believe that has caused more Christians to stop fearing God than anything. So I wrote a book, Once Saved, Always Saved, question mark. It'll be on the bookstall if you want to read more in which I mention 80 passages of scripture in which we are warned not to lose our salvation. And many people have written to me after reading that book and said, thank you, David, for restoring the fear of the Lord to me. But it's been a healthy fear, not a phobia. It hasn't paralyzed them. It has made them careful. And we all need that fear of the Lord. Finally, the last thing he has to say to the Jews is, you have the scriptures and they say we have all sinned. You also have the statutes. You have the law. And he adds two little asides to that statement and says, first, the law should be accusing you and help you to realize you're accountable to God. You shouldn't be proud of the Ten Commandments unless you're keeping them all. There was a man in Scotland who said to his minister, I'm going out to visit the Holy Land for the first time. And he said, my ambition is to climb Mount Sinai and shout the Ten Commandments from the top. And the minister said to the Scot, you do far better to stay at home and keep them. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a lovely way of telling him, the law, don't be proud of having it. Keep it. It's to accuse you and bring you to the point where you can't defend yourself. It's to silence people. And it's when you study the law of God and what he requires that you're silenced. And uh, silence in court is a healthy thing. And it's also meant to bring conviction. That's why God gave the law, 613 laws in Moses. And he gave them all to prepare them for Christ because they wouldn't be able to keep them, and God knew that. And he gave the law to arouse the sense of sin. 
That was its prime purpose. That's why it came before Christ and why that law was abolished in Christ. We shall see that also later in Romans. But John Wesley, uh, whom I revere because of my ancestors' connection with him and for his amazing ministry, John Wesley was asked, what is your method in evangelism? How come you lead so many people to Christ? And John Wesley said, when I go to a new town or village that I've never been before, he said, I spend the first week or 10 days preaching nothing but the law of God. And he says, when I begin to see some of them coming under conviction, he said, I begin to slip in a bit of the gospel until finally I'm preaching nothing but the gospel. That was a profound remark. And so Wesley went round England preaching the law first to prepare people for the gospel. And that's why we've spent this morning looking at this rather grim and even glum section of Romans. But we've got to study that first. It's preparing the way for the beauty of the gospel. Law was given first to the Jews, but to prepare them for the gospel. And that's its purpose. And to face people with God's high moral standards until they realize how far short they have fallen of the glory of God. That's the definition of sin in this very chapter. Those who have fallen short of God's glory. Now, no matter how good a jumper you are, three men were stranded on a rock with the incoming tide. And as the tide surged in, the shore seemed to go further and further. And they realized that they'd have to jump for it. One man jumped and he managed to get halfway to the shore. And then he sank in the water, drowned. Second man jumped and he was within three feet of the shore. But he too drowned. Third man braced himself and really threw himself over. And he fell short by just a foot and he drowned. It doesn't matter how far you've jumped morally. If you've fallen short, that's the end. In other words, if you fall short of God's standard by a big lot or a little lot, makes no difference. You're still a dead man. Now, therefore, we've realized at this point God's problem. People so search the Bible for an answer to their own problems that they miss that the real Bible is all about God's problem. And God's problem was very simple. Rebellious kids. That's God's problem. And praise God, he found a way of solving that problem. And the next study this afternoon will get some better news. <laughs>